Good morning from Bayside Salvos this morning. Welcome to all of those who are tuning in with us. For those who joined us last week, it's been my prayer this week that God has continued to open up and enlighten our eyes to the things unseen of the kingdom of God and that with deeper spiritual eyes of faith, we have been more attuned to the wonderful things that he has been doing in our midst. As we continue this morning to contemplate the love of Jesus, our bridegroom, and his love for the whole world, I call you to worship with some selected verses from Psalm 103 as we join with King David in his song of praise. May your hearts turn to worship right now as his word spurs us on. With my whole heart and my whole life and with my inmost being, Lord, I bow in wonder and love before you, holy God. Yahweh, you are my soul's celebration. How could I ever forget the miracles of kindness that you've done for me? You have kissed my heart with forgiveness in spite of all that I've done. You have healed me from inside and out from every disease. You have rescued me from the pit and saved my life and you have crowned me with love and mercy. You satisfy my every desire with good things. You have supercharged my life so that I may soar again like a flying eagle in the sky. Let us sing to the beautiful one of heaven this morning. Wonderful, so wonderful is your unfailing love. Your cross has spoken mercy over me. No eye has seen and no ear has heard and no heart can fully know how glorious and how beautiful you are. You've opened my eyes to the wonders of you and you've captured my heart with your love because nothing on earth is as beautiful as you. Let's sing together. Wonderful, so wonderful is your unfailing love. Your cross has spoken mercy over me. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no heart can fully know how glorious, how beautiful Oh 
My soul, my soul must sing. I pray that that's your testimony this morning as you contemplate his blessings and exercise gratitude with your lips, with your mind and with your soul. Let us continue in worship through song this morning with that beautiful hymn, Joyful, Joyful. What happens when we allow our soul and our lips and our hearts to sing in worship and in praise? The joy of our heart is opened up like flowers before him and we can express the greatest of joy even amidst the rockiest of times. Let's sing together. to our midst this morning. Holy Spirit, come and open our eyes to your wonders anew, to the joy of our heart given so freely by you and to your word this morning. May we each receive the peace, the joy and the love that you have for us this morning as we gather together in this different way. But Lord, you bind us with your spirit and in Jesus Christ and we give you praise. Amen. Good morning Bayside Salvos and all who are tuning in today with us. We just have a few updates and announcements for you this morning and obviously we'll continue to keep you updated by email as well. And the key announcement for this week is in relation to our Red Shield appeal. So our digital door knock is now underway. You will have seen um, quite a few 
posts about the digital door knock on Facebook and you will see that our Bayside fundraising page is now up and running with all of the information on what our money will go towards this year. We are aiming again this year to raise uh, $15,000 to be able to increase our capacity to support our community and do the community work that we do. So there's a number of ways that you might be able to get on board with the digital door knock this year. You can give, obviously, and uh, a number of our congregation have already um, given generously in the last week to different people's pages. The other thing you can do is to simply share, if you're on social media, to share our fundraising page um, with all your networks, your friends and family on social media. But you also, if you would like to, um, be a, a specific fundraiser where you create your own profile and your own, um, I guess, plug and personal plug to share with your friends and family on social media. You'll notice um, that Scott is committing to 100 kilometre run over the month of May and I'm committing to at least 500,000 steps for the month of May. Now you don't have to have a challenge, you can simply just create a page and share it around and thank you to all of those who already have. You will see our current fundraisers on the screen here and uh, we shout out to Barry Stevenson who's winning through the wondrous support of his family and friends at the moment, winning the, the fundraising tally. So get excited, get creative, and let's, you know, let's just um, see what we can do and see what God can do through our efforts and through our generosity in this year's Red Shield Appeal. Church, we just wanted to encourage you again with these neighbourhood contact cards. We've actually had the blessing of having them delivered this week, and they look really schmick. They're fantastic. Uh, on one side, all the details included of who we are and what we're about and your details, if you're happy to post them there. And then just some information generally about the Bayside Church on the back. So you can pick some of these up from the church office. You can come and pick some up from us at home. Just let us know about whether you'd like to be part of that. Then you can distribute them to people on your street and around your neighbourhood. Just record some of your details there. As we said, if that's not good for you to record your own details, record ours. But if you're going to record the church details, just let us know here so that we know who's done those letterbox drops and where those calls have come from. And so potentially we can connect you back up into that situation as well going forward. But we're really excited about the prospect of helping people through these cards. So if you can be involved in that with us, we'd really love to have you on the team. So neighbourhood contact cards, Red Shield Appeal, there's a few things happening that we'd love you to be part of. Don't forget, tomorrow is a public holiday and may the 4th be with you. Hi everybody, it's really great to be able to share with you in this way this morning. It's been a while, but it's really lovely to be back, even if it is in this format. I hear a lot of people, and I'm sure you have as well, talking about the future. And a lot of it seems to be surrounding the topic of fear. Questions that are really quite legitimate, like, will I have a job tomorrow? What will I do because I've lost my job? What if I run out of money? What about my family? How will my kids be affected because of school? What if one of us gets sick? Just a few questions I'm sure that have been going round some of your minds lately. But I'm assured through scripture that when it comes to fear, I don't have to fear. I don't have to fear about anything. And that could be a really big ask at the moment with so much going on. I've heard people talking very much about, you know, what about me? And it's been demonstrated on the TV of a lot of selfishness about what we want and what we need. But I've heard another phrase coming out and it's a really good one. It's about we, not me. When I think about fear, the verse from Isaiah 41.10 came immediately to mind. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. I can be bold and I can be strong because God is with me, no matter what just like the song said. 
We're going to take a moment just to stop and think about how amazingly generous God has been to you and to me throughout this time. And in fact, not just over this time, but always. God is an amazing, generous God. You know, Neil and I made a decision a long time ago that we were going to put aside a portion of our income each fortnight and bring it back to him as our tithe. We've chosen to do this through internet banking and I know there's a lot of people at Bayside who do exactly the same thing. And I want to acknowledge your generous giving. But with us not being able to meet in person, it means that it can be a bit difficult for those who used to be very generous in giving through cash in our envelopes. And we'd like to just to make you aware of the fact that if you would like, you can actually change over and give through electronic banking. The bank details are going to come up on the screen. And if you need any further help with that, please just contact Scott or even myself and we'll be able to help you out. You're also going to be receiving a letter that will keep you updated on your giving and what the Corps is doing to minister to those in need at the moment. Be assured that that has not stopped because of isolation. It's just happening differently. And we do lift up in prayer those wonderful people who are continuing to step up and to minister to many people in so many different ways. So we give thanks to God for all that he has given to us, for all he provides for us, for the assurance that he will never leave us. And as we take a moment to reflect on what he has done and given for, to us, let's take the opportunity to say thank you. Let's pray. Loving Father, we do come to you right now and we give you thanks. Thank you because we don't need to fear that even though things are going on around us that we can't understand, we know that we do not go through that alone. And I think of those of our family who are going through so many other things at the moment. Some things that we don't even know about, but you do. And we thank you that you are there and that you do not leave us. So Father, for those who have brought their gifts to you, we just pray a blessing, a blessing as we worship you in this way. Amen. God bless you and may you know God's strength and abundant provision as you put your faith in him and trust God alone for what is to come. Bye-bye. Bayside Kiddlywinks, I hope you're going well. What day is it today? It's the first Sunday of the month. Are you like me and keep losing track of what day we're even up to? Well, I can promise you that today is the first Sunday of the month and you know what that means for kids time this morning. Now, very sadly, I can't get you to run around and um, get money from all the adults, but what I want you to do first today is go and get a cup from somewhere in your house and I want you to take it round to all the other people in your house and see if anyone has 
some loose change that they can put in your cup and then I'm going to tell you what to do with it. So go and do that, take a minute, grab a cup and see if you've got any loose change in your house while I get ready here. All right, have you come back? I hope you've got some money in your cup. Now, what I want you to do today while the sermon is on and if you are feeling creative, I've got a little project for you. I don't know how many months we're not going to be able to come back to church, which means I don't know how many first Sundays of the month we're going to miss being together. So I had an idea and I hope you can join with me and I hope you like it. So what I want you to do after kids time when the message is on or perhaps later today is to go around and find something, a container of some sort, that you can make into a loose change jar to start collecting loose change. And I'll tell you about why in a minute. So you might have a Chinese container, you might have a butter container or something like that. You might have a, a coffee tin or a um, Makona bottle, Makona coffee bottle that you wanna use. Maybe a spare ice cream container that you've eaten all the ice cream from and you can find one of those. Whatever it is, just something that you can use for the next little while to use as our sponsor child money collection tin in your house. Now, if you don't have children in your house, adults, and you have a crafty person and you want something to do, you might be able to do this too. So that every household for the next little while will have a container that we can use to collect our money for our sponsored children. The other idea I had was if, because kids we didn't get to bring our ballet boxes this year, if you've still got your ballet box intact at home, you might want to use that. So what I want you to do with it is to find any type of creative stuff. So I'm not going to make one today because I'm sure you are way more creative than me. So I've got a few ideas here, but I'm sure you'll have plenty of others. So you might want to cover it, cover your container with paper and either draw a picture on it or colour it in, or maybe you want to get your paints out and paint something to put around it. You might have some bits and pieces like bottle tops or fabric or even some shells or cotton balls or anything 3D like that, that you can use to create the most beautiful box for your sponsored children. So I want to see all different boxes in all different shapes and sizes with all different amazing collage material all over the top. And what I thought would be really cool, and as I said, other households without kids can do this as well, on the first first Sunday of the month when we're back, so the very when we come back to church, the first Sunday of the month, which is our sponsor child month, we will see all these beautiful decorated boxes coming back to church with all sorts of amounts of loose change in them to bring for our sponsor kids on that first Sunday, first Sunday that we come back. Wouldn't that be awesome? So what I want you to do is make your box and put it somewhere in your house. And even if it's not the first Sunday, maybe any time at all during any week where people have spare change in your house, they can put it in the box and we'll just keep collecting it until we're back together and then we can bring it all and count it and see how much we've all saved over the time that we haven't been able to be together. So that's your activity today. You might also want to put some prayers in the box as the months go on. You might want to write some little prayers and put them in the boxes as well for your sponsor, for the kids in our sponsor communities and countries. It's probably pretty safe to say at the moment that the communities where we're sponsoring through our sponsorship program are doing it a lot more tough than us with this whole COVID-19 thing, right? So I know I've heard from Lyndon Armstrong in our church about some of his friends over in Kenya and things are really, really challenging there for them. So I'm sure that in all of our sponsorship communities, people are really struggling with all sorts of things. So they really need our prayers as well as our money right now. So that's your task for this week. Make a beautiful box. You can send photos to me if you like, but I actually think we might keep them and surprise everyone when we come back together so we can see them all brought in together and um, 
just see what an amazing job you've done. So you can send me some sneak, pre sneak peeks so I can see what you've been doing, but we won't show them to the whole church until we come back together and it'll be amazing to see them all. Maybe we can start using those to collect our money in when we come back together rather than our green cups. So I hope you enjoy creating your beautiful sponsored children money box and I look forward to seeing you again soon. So let me pray for our Lighthouse kids and our sponsor communities this morning. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you that you are a God who is above all, who is in control, who is generous, who is provider and who is so many things. Lord, I bring our Lighthouse kids um, to you this morning. I pray over all of them protection. I pray wisdom as they uh, do their remote learning from home in these days and as they manage the change that is upon them at the moment. I pray for creativity and calm and a, just a sense of joy in all that they do. I also want to pray, Lord, both for kids and for all of the families in the communities uh, for which we sponsor in our church with these generous gifts that we continue to bring for our sponsor communities. We pray in these days that you will uplift them, that you will keep them um, assured of your presence, that you would bring uh, a sense of security, a sense of peace and a sense of hope in these days as their communities band together and as the money that we give and others all around the world give uh, contribute to their well-being, their livelihood and uh, in keeping them safe and keeping them together. Thank you, Father, for all that you do. Bless the givers at this time as well and may the uh, money that we continue to raise in our homes that we will bring back together shortly be uh, multiplied and be blessed and may the hearts of those who give be blessed as well. Thank you, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hi, church. It's Fiona here. Hi, everyone. Melissa here too. We're doing the prayer time today. Um, and we're going to be focusing on a verse that um, Scott is talking about in the sermon, which is John 3.29, and where John the Baptist says, talking about Jesus, he is the bridegroom and the bride belongs to him. I am the friend of the bridegroom who stands nearby, listens with great joy to the bridegroom's voice, and because of his words, my joy is complete and overflows. The idea that the voice of Jesus speaking brings us great joy is such an exciting one. And yet, when we talk about hearing God's voice individually, some of us get intimidated or even feel really spiritually inadequate. In Matthew 18, the disciples came to Jesus and asked him who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God. And Jesus turned all their preconceived notions on their head by drawing a little child into the conversation and basically saying, unless we become like children, we won't ever enter the kingdom of God. I love the way the Passion Translation puts it. It says, learn this well, unless you dramatically change your way of thinking and become teachable and learn about heaven's kingdom realm with the wide-eyed wonder of a child, you will never be able to enter in. So what is it about children that Jesus was trying to show us? Well, you only have to spend five minutes in the company of a child to know that what they do most of the time is play. And when they play, they're not worried about whether their play works or not, whether it's successful or not. They just give it a go. And if it doesn't work, they try something else. But they just enjoy the whole experience. And that, I believe, is what Jesus wants us to bring into our conversations with him. He wants us to bring that vulnerability, that openness, that confidence that he is going to speak to us when we come and talk to him. As we get older, the problem starts to be that, that we lose that playfulness and we think our spiritual life has to be grown up as well. And what that means is that we start to use guidelines and rules around how our spiritual life should be with Jesus. But what we end up doing is losing intimacy with him and that's what Jesus really longs for us to have. So we pray for what we want, we pray for what we need, we pray according to these guidelines that we've put in place. But what we end up being is actually fearful or controlling. We think that Jesus is going to ask us to give stuff up or ask us to do stuff that we don't want to do because we've lost our intimacy with him. So instead what Jesus is saying is let your guard down. Come to me. Be open and free with me and start to enjoy that beautiful intimacy that you can have with me just like kids have that freedom as well. 
Jesus speaks to us in lots of different ways. He can speak to us through scripture. He can speak to us, of course, through others. But he can speak to us in those still whispers, the promptings of the Holy Spirit through dreams, through visions. And he is longing to speak to you today and enjoy that relationship and that intimacy with you. So today we thought that we might have a prayer session together with you where it will be slightly different. Normally, I think we think we brainstorm prayer ideas about what we've heard people need or what they want. Today, we're actually going to ask Jesus, what does he want us to pray? What does he want us to be saying to him today? So we've designed this time to be kid-friendly and interactive and available to everyone. So we're inviting you to come and pray with us now, whether you're by yourself or with your family or whoever's with you today. Gather together now and have a prayer time and we'll be putting some, some questions up on the screen for you to do during this time. Jesus, we thank you so much for being with us today, for teaching us how to pray, for revealing what it is that you want us to pray for, and just being here with us, being intimate with us, being connected with us, and loving us always. We pray all this in your name. Amen. Amen. After this, Jesus and his disciples went out into the Judean countryside where he spent some time with them and baptised. Now John also was baptising at Anon, near Salim, because there was plenty of water and people were coming and being baptised. This was before John was put in prison. An argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi! That man who is with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, look, he is baptizing and everyone is going to him. To this John replied, a person can receive only what is given them from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said I am not the Messiah, but I am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him 
and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine, and it is now complete. He must become greater, I must become less. The one who comes from above is above all. The one who is from the earth belongs to the earth and speaks as one from the earth. The one who comes from heaven is above all. So you might have noticed that most of the stories we tell about little Johnny don't tend to be true. This might just be another one of those. There's a story about little Johnny playing out in the backyard and his mum's watching through the window and really impressed by the fact that he's enjoying himself out there. And he comes in and he says to mum, I'm playing church. And he says, our cat Tiddles is playing church with me. And she thinks, this is fantastic, you know. He's entertaining himself and getting involved in this activity. So she looks out the window and here he is. Tiddles is sitting there in front of him and he's preaching away to Tiddles and it's all going very, very well. And the mum's spectacularly impressed and she goes into another room of the house and then starts to hear the cat caterwauling and mewing and carrying on and she walks back out into the kitchen and here's her son, little Johnny, trying to douse the cat in a bucket in the backyard. And she knows immediately, I, I guess I know where he's coming from with this. This is his next step in the process. I've preached to him, now it's time to baptise him. And he's trying to baptise the cat and it's not going well. The cat's not interested, as you can imagine. And so the mum runs out and says, look, Johnny, you just can't do that. The cat's not going to be up for it. I don't know why you're trying. And little Johnny says, well, mum, I don't understand. If Tiddles didn't want to be baptised, why did he join my church in the first place? You see, baptism is sometimes an interesting reality for people to embrace. This story that we're going to look at today, we're going to see people who are desperate to be baptised. And in fact, they were going to get baptised by either Jesus or his disciples or by John. And it takes us to a place of examining this story of John the Baptist and Jesus and just what goes on here. So you might remember where we've been. Just last week, we were talking about Jesus and Nicodemus and the incredible place of faith in our lives, of how significant and important it is to have faith, that that's actually the capstone of our experience with God, that we spiritually discern this faith as a gift from him and it makes all the difference for life. And we walk on from that into this story of Jesus and John the Baptist, John chapter 3, verses 22 through 36. And we see that Jesus goes out into the Judean countryside and he starts baptising alongside his disciples. And John the Baptist is baptising elsewhere. And this starts to cause some consternation to at least a few people because lots of people are coming to be baptised. But it seems like quite a lot are going to Jesus to be baptised. And so some of John's followers start to get a bit uncomfortable about this. And you can almost imagine them coming to John and saying, look, John, not happy, John. What's going on here? Why is Jesus suddenly the one that people want to be baptised by? You've offered the baptism of repentance. We've been your disciples. What's going on here? And John's actually totally chilled out about this reality. It doesn't really bother him at all. And we hear in verse 27 and following why it doesn't bother him and why he's totally okay with this reality. That Jesus is actually going in one direction and John's going in the other direction. And why is John the Baptist okay with that? That's just what we want to speak about for a few moments today. First of all, John the Baptist is okay with that because he knows his place and he knows Jesus' place. He understands the difference there. Just look at those verses 27 through 29 and it makes it really clear what's going on here. John the Baptist knows what he has received. He says, I'm just working on what I've received. You know, I can work with that. That's what I can do. That's my role. I came to be the one who offered this baptism of repentance, the voice crying in the wilderness. And now the Christ, the Messiah is coming. Verse 28, he makes it really clear, doesn't it? He said, I've already told you, it's back in John chapter 1, I've already told you that I'm not the Christ. I'm not the Messiah. I've merely come to prepare the way for him. And so on that journey, he's pointing out to them, I know my place. I know where I fit in. 
And in fact, he goes with this beautiful imagery in verse 29 of the friend of the bridegroom. You know, he builds this picture here of the bridegroom and the bride at the wedding. And the bridegroom, by implication here, is Jesus. And the bride, as we start to explore it and see the imagery that comes from a book like Revelation, we see, well, the bride is God's people. Jesus is going to come as the bridegroom in love for God's people. And John the Baptist says, hey, I'm the friend of the bridegroom. I'm the one who comes to be part of this celebration with him. It's a really, really special role for me. But I know my place. I'm the friend of the bridegroom. It's a beautiful place to be. I get to watch on as this beautiful movement of love happens. But I know my place. And more than that, he knows Jesus' place. See, that's the other thing that's really clear here. He says, I know he's the bridegroom. I know he's the one who's going to come and bring this love in continuity and company with the bride. And that I need to stand alongside and celebrate with him, watch on as the joy of this moment is captured. And there's imagery here from Mark chapter 2. Jesus actually speaks about being the bridegroom there in Mark chapter 2. He tells people, I am the bridegroom and while I'm here, the people should celebrate. They should be excited by the fact that I'm here. Then that imagery from Revelation again reminds us, this is the imagery of what's happening in this story. And in that moment, Jesus in his place, the bridegroom, John the Baptist in his place, the friend of the bridegroom, and their joy together as they walk along this journey. John the Baptist sums it up beautifully in verse 31. He says, you know what? Here's the one who is from above, and here's the one who is above all. Here's the one who is from above, and here's the one who is above all. That's why I understand my place in his place. That's why I'm okay with the fact that many can go and follow him, and that's totally okay. And it's actually a place that we really need to get comfortable with for ourselves, isn't it? A place where we say, God can be God and I can be his willing servant, his friend, the vessel that works alongside the bridegroom, the friend who accompanies him on the journey, but know my place and his place and be okay with that. Be comforted by that. We don't have to worry about all the minutiae of those matters because God's got it. Jesus in heaven has all those matters. We know our place. We know his place. And not just knowing that reality, but actually knowing the next part of this reality, which is what John gets to next. He says, I also figure and understand that Jesus is actually the source of real joy. For everything that I'm doing and everything that I'm involved in here, Jesus is actually the one who truly brings joy. He is the joy bringer. That's what happens as the groom comes at the wedding. I see the joy of that moment. And I am, as the friend of the bridegroom, I'm waiting and listening for the voice of the bridegroom. That's going to bring me joy and that's going to make my joy complete. The source of his joy is in the bridegroom. And the source of his joy is in waiting and listening to him, in trying to find his voice. And then it says also in verse 29, that joy will be complete. And when we think about it, this makes perfect sense too, because this is the reality of saying, God as the creator and giver of all good things says, actually, I'm the one who created joy in the first place. I am the source of all joy. And so if you want to know joy, how do you do that? You come into my presence, you wait with me, you listen with me, you respond to my voice and your joy can be real. Jesus, the source of true joy. John knew it, and it meant that he could walk this journey of saying, you know what, Jesus is going this way and I'm going this way, and that's totally okay because my joy is in him. It's not in my circumstances. It's not in the success of my ministry. It's not in anything that I do. It's just in him. And this is such a great reality again for us to understand for ourselves because how often can we be caught up in this idea that Joy is all about whether I'm going well, whether things are going well, whether circumstances are as I would wish them to be. And God's saying to us, no, I'm the source of your joy. I'm the one who created it in the first place. Come and wait with me. Listen with me. Walk with me. 
be the friend of the bridegroom on this journey and watch on as the joy just grows because I'm the one who brings that joy. It's an amazing reality here that John the Baptist longs to see joy in Jesus and he longs for us to know the same, that that's the source of joy. The joy of the bridegroom becomes completely his on that journey. So it's a great question for us to ask. Where are we trying to find joy? Because if we don't try and find it in God himself, in the bridegroom, in the source of real joy, we're just going to go around and around in circles. And that's going to be so, so frustrating for us. In waiting and listening to him, that's where we find our joy. And then this reality, John 3 verse 30 sums it up so beautifully. John says there, you know what? He has to increase and I have to decrease. There needs to be more of him and less of me. And that's okay with me because I know the path we're on. I know the direction we're following. And that's totally the sense of where John the Baptist sees his life going, his ministry going, and everything about his circumstances. He must become greater. And as he becomes greater, I will inevitably become less as people are drawn to him, as people see the ministry that he's performing and the miracles and the wonder and the teaching of his life, I will most definitely become less because I've become a person preaching a message for repentance, for turning to God. And here is God, God in the flesh available to people. He must become greater. I must become less. And in fact, in John the Baptist's story, this becomes really painfully true. We don't hear it here in the Gospel of John, but for example, in the Gospel of Mark, we hear about how that becomes even more John the Baptist's reality in his earthly life. That he comes to a point, Mark chapter 6 tells this story, where in fact he challenges Herod Antipas, the king of the time in that region. He challenges him about his affair with his brother's wife. You know, it's a pretty salacious story, but he challenges him about that fact and says, that's not right. What you have done there is not okay. Herod Antipas has taken Herodias, who was the wife of his brother, as his own wife. John the Baptist points this out. And John the Baptist is arrested and imprisoned as a result. And Herodias is desperate to do away with him because he's the one who's bringing dishonour to her by telling this story. And John the Baptist is imprisoned. Herod isn't actually that comfortable to do away with John the Baptist because he's really intrigued by the way he talks, by the prophetic nature of his ministry, and he just really can't deal with taking away his life, but he keeps him imprisoned. And then it comes to this part in the story in Mark chapter 6, where in fact Herodias wins a favour from Herod, her husband, and he says, you can ask me whatever you like and I will do it. And so she asks for John's head on a platter. And that's exactly what happens. So this phraseology here in John chapter 3 and verse 30, we read it, he must become greater, I must become less. This is going to have a really, really dynamic conclusion in John the Baptist's life. Yes, Jesus will become greater. And as his ministry goes, not only will John the Baptist recede into the background, but he'll actually lose his life in the service of Christ, following the one whom is both his cousin, but also his Lord. And it's really interesting to think about how he does that journey. How do you follow that journey through? And what we see, I believe, is that this whole account that we've read here in John chapter 3 is his grounds for taking those steps. See, what we followed through here, this idea that John the Baptist knew his place and he knew Jesus' place, that meant that he could walk that journey of obedience. John the Baptist knew the source of his real joy, his lasting joy, his lasting reality with God was going to be in waiting for him and listening to him and following his direction. And that's what he did all the way to those last days of imprisonment and then the loss of his life. And then also this deep reality of knowing, yeah, he will become greater and I will become less and that's fine because that's the journey of walking with Jesus, growing like Jesus, being his follower. That's how he puts this all together. 
He truly understands that these elements have led him to this place. And so he's okay. His disciples weren't okay. John's disciples were really taken aback by this idea. But this is what Jesus came to bring, a place of us knowing our place and his place. A place of us knowing that he was the source of joy and not anything else in our circumstances. And finally, a place where he would become greater and we would become less and we would be fine with that because we are friends of the bridegroom. We are walking with him. We are following him. As we conclude today, we're going to sing a song about keeping that same vision that was before John as our central vision. That John the Baptist knew that Jesus was his vision. Jesus was his Lord. Jesus was his master. He was the one that he was going to follow through this journey. And we're going to sing words that have actually been around in the church for a long time, but celebrate this idea that God will be our vision that we will make him the one at the centre of all that we do, that we'll be able to say the same things that John the Baptist did about our place in his place, about the source of joy that we find in Jesus and about the reality of wanting him to become greater and being okay with becoming less as his servants, his followers, his disciples as a result. So sing this song with us today. Sing it as your affirmation, as your encouragement to say, yeah, I want to keep going on that growing journey more and more like Jesus, just like John the Baptist did, because Jesus is my vision. Jesus is the one that I pursue, and I'm totally okay with being a friend of his on this journey of life. God bless you all, and God bless us all to continue that journey together.
Well, God bless you all and have a wonderful week. Children and husbands, remember it's Mother's Day next Sunday. Make sure you spoil the women of your house. Kids, remember to get those boxes beautifully made to start collecting coins in for, your, for our sponsored children. And just a benediction now from Colossians 3, 16 to 17. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your heart to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father through him. Amen. Have a great week.